So I gather around. The technical boys can get the screen ready because we've got our very special guest here tonight. I'm going to introduce you to a man who an ancient Greek, a good boy, saved his life. He's got a very fascinating story. His name is Gary Wilmont, and he's a motivational speaker, and his business is no more Mr. Fat Guy. I probably need to speak to him. <laughs> That's a joke. Uh, he, so, without further ado, can I have everyone listening to the guest speaker tonight, Gary. Thank you very much. Thank you, Manny. Well, I don't know about you, but uh, when I think about ancient civilizations, I think in terms of Romans and Greeks, and you generally categorize those civilizations on different values and attributes. I mean, for example, when you think of the Romans, there's a very mechanical, methodical, militaristic aspect to the Romans. They built straight roads. They put together fantastic battle tactics. And uh, you'd have to consider them to be the engineers and the, pretty much the, the hard-edged society from ancient times. Uh, we got, got, got a clicker with that. <laughs> so, um, but you contrast that with the Greeks... And I think Manny has exemplified uh, what we all kind of think. When we think of Greece, we think of modern Greece or ancient Greece, we tend to think of a softer culture. We tend to think of the arts, and we tend to think of philosophy, and we tend to think of their gods and their goddesses. And uh, if, you, uh, if you've ever doubted that these ancient civilizations have an impact on modern society, in Western civilization, Consider the fact that education for college students and university students worldwide, now there's a central component to the entire education system without which their experience would be different today. I'm talking, of course, about the toga party. I mean, no student would uh, go through the same educational experience. But when you think about the Greeks, so you've got the philosophers, you've got the science, but the science has got a very philosophical edge to it. And you've got the sporting uh, aspects. And you just get that impression of a really soft, warm culture. But there's a harder side to the Greeks. There's, you know, ancient times, everybody was trying to get a bit of everybody else. And uh, approximately 500 BC, for about 40 years, uh, the Greeks were actually locking horns with the Persians. And the Persians are modern-day Iranians. So uh, sometimes things don't actually change. But um, within uh, those Persian wars, I mean, you've probably all seen 300. You know, the 300 Spartans that held the pact. I mean, that's, that's, uh, that's, that's part of the second Persian war. So I'm educating you tonight. I hope you're going to like, take notes. There'll be a test later. But uh, what we want to concentrate on is the first Greco-Persian war. And... Uh, there's some fantastic stories behind that, and I want to go into one in particular, which is the guy that is kind of my hero and saved my life, effectively. Now, when you think about wars in modern times, we're all, you know, we all survive every single war that goes on. Now, we are all there. We've got the cameras. We've got, you know, we've got people twi tweeting and Facebook, and everything's all over the place. You go back to ancient Greece, there were no mobile phones. There was nobody saying, hash Persia v. Greece, lol. Yeah, there, was no, there was no Facebook updates. Now, we couldn't go to a live results site. We didn't get a live feed. So how did the ancient Greeks and, and the ancient cultures in general actually communicate between each other? How did they let each other know who was winning, who was losing, who needed reinforcements? So they had messengers. And this guy here is the guy that's the central piece to the beginning of my story. This guy's name is Phidippides. That's very easy for me to say. I'm sure with a couple of wines inside you, you're not going to be able to pronounce that. Uh, he's also known as Philippides, just to confuse you. And if you look at him, he's actually, you can tell he's a runner. First of all, he's actually at the vanguard of modern-day running styles. This guy is barefoot running. That's all the rage. He's wearing compression socks. They look a little bit heavy, 
but that's an early prototype of compression socks. It must be a fun run. He's wearing a tutu. And he's obviously doing an endurance event because that, that vest is not just a singlet. That's clearly a hydration pack. But Pheidippides was sent from Athens to Sparta because the Persians were invading and the Athenians, the Greeks, needed, needed a helping hand. So they sent for their friends in Sparta. So he ran 246 kilometers to Sparta. And basically they said, yeah, no, we'd really like to help. Um, yeah, that's cool. Um, but we have to wait till the full moon. So give us a couple of days and maybe we'll dispatch a squadron, you know, a battalion, whatever. Um, so then he ran back and delivered that news. And then uh, he toddled off to where the battle was taking place, uh, which was a fennel field. And I'll give you a clue where we're leading with this, because the Greek word for fennel, anybody know the Greek word for fennel? Money? Marathon, apparently, according to Wikipedia, so don't quote me on it. But um, he went off to Marathon, the Battle of Marathon, and the Greeks overcame the Persians. So how had, had they let the Athenians know? They had, hey, everything's gone okay. So this guy runs approximately 40 kilometers back to Athens and delivers the message that there has been victory over the Persians. Now, how the hell does this feed into me? Now, well, how does this save my life? I bet you all go, hey, what's this guy talking about? This is like a history lesson. I'm bored to tears. Bring on the wine. So we go to the next one. And um, the only way I can really make this connection is to take it. A lot of you haven't heard the story. So I want to take you through just a little potted history of me and, and where we, how we get to where we are today. So if you don't mind, I'll just share. Um, as you can tell, at the age of about 14, I was almost as cute and good looking as I am today. And um, the reason I'm in that uniform, I was actually a sea cadet in the UK, and I come from the southwest of the UK. I grew up on a council estate, just an ordinary guy, ordinary family, ordinary background. My mum's dad, my grandpa, served in the Royal Navy in the Second World War. Um, on reflection, uh, he died when I was eight years old of a heart attack, and that helped reinforce the fact that I wanted to follow his footsteps. I wanted to join the Royal Navy. I don't know if you've ever, when you were a kid, did you want to do something so much, you just knew that you weren't going to do anything else ever, and there was no other possible thought of what you were going to do. That was me. That was me. That was the Royal Navy. And at the age of 15, I went up to the recruitment centre and passed the entrance exam for flying colours. I was on my way. It was all going to happen. It was all clicking into place. Until I went up for a second, a second visit to the recruitment centre. And we did all the paperwork, and the Marine Warrant Officer was very excited, and he wanted me to open a second application for officer entry, and it was all looking great. And then the results came down from the medical. I had a hearing loss. I didn't know until that moment that I had a hearing loss. And suddenly all those years of knowing exactly what I was going to be, what I was going to do, and I was going to travel the world, I was going to have adventures, and I was going to have an impact on the world, I was going to serve in the Royal Navy, I was going to serve the public, I was going to serve Her Majesty the Queen, and all that kind of stuff. I was reduced to a guy, 15, 16 years old, in the centre of Bristol in the UK, on the phone to my mum, crying, and saying, it's not happening. So what happened then, I mean, I don't know, what would you do now? I mean, I'd probably tell myself then, don't worry about it. I think we were talking before that, you know, that's not a good thing, it's not a bad thing, it's just something that is and you should move on and just deal with it. Now, to a 15-year-old, and that's all I was ever going to do, I was devastated. It was the end of the world. I didn't know what I was going to do. And I became goalless, aimless, ambitionless, and just drifted. I drifted into a college life. And then I drifted into the life that was pretty much being lived. By, I, bear in mind, I come from a working class town in the UK. Everybody had worked on the building sites, in factories, earned their money. We used to get wage slips. We used to get that thing called cash that Manny's so keen on. Um, we used to get cash at the end of the week. And a lot of people just get down to pub. And before they'd even got home, half that money was spent behind the bar. Yeah, that was my life. I mean... Work Monday to Friday, live, night, live for the weekend, get drunk, 
and uh, in line with the Greek theme, funny enough, uh, about three o'clock in the morning, end up at a kebab shop. And then at three o'clock the following afternoon, you'd wake up and you were still in your disco gear and you had your best shirt on and the congealed contents of a lamb product was sliding down the front and it looked like a good choice for breakfast. So that was my life and I was a pack-a-day smoker from the age of 15, smoking, drinking. I think these days they call it you only live once. It's the YOLO lifestyle. Back then we called it going down to the pub, getting pissed on a weekend and having, having fun. So the net result of all this was that I became this guy. <laughs> this is my current Australian citizen's passport photo. I'm not allowed to leave the country. <laughs> no, seriously, the last time I travelled, I got congratulated at passport control for, what I'd, for the amount of weight that I'd lost. <laughs> Thanks for that. I was just ill that day. You know? <laughs> it's just a passport photo. Um, but it, this is the guy that I became. Basically, I'd given up on life. I'd given up on goals. I became increasingly bitter, negative, sarcastic, developed a negative mindset. I became that guy. I mean, who's worked with that guy where they get passed over for promotion in the office and it's somebody else's fault? You know, they deserved that promotion. They deserved this. This needed to happen. Life is unfair. And that was me. I would quite happily say that's me and that's part of who I was. That's where that attitude took me. That's where that mindset took me. And I got lucky because kind of at the age of 42, that 15-year-old was still inside me. It's like this little voice, you know, that had been bugging me actually for about maybe a decade. And it kind of went, do you know what? There's more to life than this. This isn't how it's supposed to be. We have got to do something about it. And lucky for me, I made that decision to change my life. I mean, it's, it's a big step. That's probably the biggest thing that I've done, to be perfectly honest. That's the biggest thing I've done in the last few years was make that one decision. Because when you turn around and you make that decision and you tell people that you live with and you tell people that know you and you want to go and you go out in public and you tell the guys that you go down the pub with that you're going to become healthy and you're not going to smoke and you're not going to do this, you're not going to do that. What's the reaction? The reaction is, don't be stupid, come and have a beer. You know, life's too short, blah, blah, blah. So I decided, um, basically I went, underwent an 18-month process. I mean, the first six months I spent getting fit. I got to the point where running for the bus didn't result in me, I mean, we're talking 100 metres, running for the bus didn't result in me sat on the bus, puffing and panting and in a pool of sweat. And then the first thing I did as soon as I got off the bus was lit a cigarette, because that's what you do. So I went from that guy to somebody who started to get up early in the morning, go for a walk, train, eat a little bit more healthily, gave, in, gave up the smoking. And then there were six months leading up to becoming, becoming a runner. I hated running. I never completed the cross-country course at school. And that was like three Ks. I did it a few years ago just for a laugh. And going, I'm sure this was about 35 Ks. It's actually about three Ks. So I decided to set my goal to be a marathon which is where Fidipides comes in. If it hadn't been for him, the marathon wouldn't exist. I wouldn't have grown up watching the London Marathon on TV. Goal wouldn't have been set. So the most ridiculous thing I could think was to run a marathon. And this photo here, this is the contrast of where I was. That was a family barbecue. And the guy on the right is, uh, has just run the entire 10 kilometres of Fremantle Fun Run. And I went from there, so I started training for my marathon. So we go to the next slide, and this is me running the Perth Marathon. In June 2013, I rocked up with a whole bunch of like, serious, crazy people that were going to go and run 42 Ks. And I spent six hours and 47 minutes out there on that Perth Marathon course. I finished dead last, and I didn't care. Because the minute that I crossed that finish line, there was an 18-month project. I'd set a goal. I'd set milestones along the way. I'd worked at everything I needed to work at. And I'd overcome obstacles. I'd faced demons. I'd dealt with that 15-year-old. In fact, four weeks before this marathon, I did a half marathon as part of my training program. And at about 
kilometre 14, I had a conversation in my head with a 14-year-old version of myself who said, that's fine, you can give up now, you've proved your point, <laughs> I'm going to like, shut up, sit back there and let me show you how to finish something for a change. And that's the kind of crazy that started going on in my mind. When I crossed that Perth finish line, that was supposed to be it. Guess what? It wasn't. Because what I'm discovering is that every finish line is a new start line. And I became completely enthused with the running idea. I, I realised that I could change my thinking and I could achieve things and I could achieve... If I could achieve this, if me, like the 140-odd kilo smoking and drinking fat guy, could become somebody that completed a marathon then what the hell was, you know, wasn't possible. You know, I could achieve anything. So I ended up in a conversation with the Heart Foundation and in April 2014, I completed the London Marathon. And I... <laughs> I went from six hours, 47 minutes, I'd taken my training seriously. And I went from 6 hours and 47 minutes to 5 hours, 23 and 28 seconds. You would trust me, your PB, you will remember to the second. I proudly ran it as an Australian. And in the last few kilometres, wave it. That's actually um, a Tetley, uh, not Tetley, um, Tui's. You know, on Australia Day, they hand out flag capes. I took mine with me. And in the last few kilometres, running down through the embankment, getting that flag out behind gave me the push that I needed because there was cries of Aussie, Aussie, Aussie. I hate that chant, but I loved it on that day and it kept me going. But I completed that. My parents came down, they saw me, I dedicated it to my grandpa. I ran it for the Heart Foundation. Grandpa died of a heart attack. Guess what? I suddenly realised why the hell I was doing this. And then, from there, you think this is crazy? I really went crazy for running and I've done... Uh, if we go on to the next one, um, I've literally, we do a comparison. Like Phidippides, what did he do? He ran Athens to Sparta, 246 kilometres. Cool. He's the inspiration for a modern day event called the Spartathlon. Cool. Marathon to Athens, 40k, inspiration for the modern day marathon. Like this guy's done like two things of note, you know? So my list Perth, London, Gold Coast, Brisbane Marathon, 42.2k's each. You know, this is me going crazy. Done the Six Inch Trail, the Lark Hill Dust to Dawn, Australia Day Ultra twice, and Bunbury Three Waters Ultra, which are all ultra marathons of 50 kilometres. And why am I doing this? I did this because, and, and this last training exercise, a three day walk. I walked from Perth, uh, from Bunbury to Perth. I basically ran 50 k's on the Sunday, rested up on Sunday night. Monday morning, I was on the Southwest Highway walking back to Perth. Because it's a training exercise for my craziest idea to date. And if we go to the next one, I decided and I made a YouTube video and announced to the world that I was going to run from Perth to Brisbane. At the time, it was a total distance of about 4,500 kilometres, something like that. And as soon as I put it out, nobody said no. The world is full of, the running community especially, is full of enablers. They all went, that's fantastic. And when you come through Melbourne, I'll run a bit with you. When you come through Adelaide, I'll run a bit with you. When I'm going, my route doesn't go through those capitals. Okay, go back and I'll amend it and Google Maps. The internet's a dangerous place. So I came up with this new route, 5,400 k's, going through Adelaide, Melbourne, a little side visit to Canberra, Sydney, up through the Gold Coast into Brisbane. And I put it out there, and I actually made a video, and I said, I have no idea how I'm going to do this. I have no idea how I'm going to get the time. I have no idea how I'm going to get the money, how I'm going to fund it, who's going to support it, how on earth I'm going to be fit enough, strong enough, mentally capable of doing something like this, but I'll tell you what I know, is I know that I'm going to cross a virtual finish line in Brisbane, I know how it's going to feel, and I know that in doing so, I'm going to prove to a whole load of people that whatever they want to do in life, they can go out and achieve. And I stuck to that goal, and I let it burn away as a passionate desire, and then on the 16th of May last year, 
my local park run in Canning River. It was a rainy day. It was a horrible day. And I woke up in the morning and I thought, I could just, like, not turn up. <laughs> like, maybe, maybe if I just, like, post on the internet, it's all just a joke, lol. <laughs> maybe, maybe this, maybe that. And, then, and you just go, do you know what? I've got to get up. Because if I don't get up and I don't go down to Canning River and I don't turn up, Channel 10 phoned me and said, is it okay for us to come down and film you? I'm going, really? <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, and then they said, is it still happening because it's raining? Yes, yes, it's, it's still happening, even with the rain. And I thought, well, if I don't go down there, I've spent all these months, like 18 months on the internet saying I was going to do this. You know, I put YouTube videos out. I've contacted... I did Sue Papadoulos' course, you know, <laughs> to help me get some media attention. We had media attention. We had... People waiting for me to turn up. If I hadn't have turned up, I would have just destroyed my own confidence and I would have had to have left Perth. I probably would have left Australia and would have had to gone back to the UK. And we don't, yeah, it's cold over there and miserable and wet and horrible and summer's one day long. So I didn't want to do that. So we turned up and we set off and um, I went, hit the open road. And like these two guys, I'll tell you about the, the support because I was committed to what I wanted to do, because I had that passion, because of that belief, and we stuck to it, and we stuck to the vision, the support crew came out through the sponsors. I mean, it was just... It just came together perfectly. These guys were just two backpackers. One of them wanted to travel Australia, would run out of money, and had been dating somebody that was one of my sponsors. So, <laughs> said, hey, you know, do you want to go and do this thing? I heard you want to go do some travel, and he said, no, oh, that sounds good to me. I've got no money left, and... Um, yeah, that, that's great. And I've got this mate coming across from the UK and he was going to join me so he can be crew as well. So Ben, the guy with the shades on, he landed at Adelaide and then Oles, the guy in the middle, like, went and met him and said, change your plan. We're not going to go and hit all the hot spots. We're not going to get drunk. We're not going to uh, meet lots of Aussie chicks. We're going to go in a camper van with this 40-odd-year-old guy that I've spent about half an hour with in total so far who's completely bonkers and says he's going to run and walk across Australia. Go, hey, cool, that's good, let's go for it. So I'd literally spent a total of about two hours with these guys before we decided to basically set up home together for four months. And we set out on the biggest adventure of our life. And what an experience. What an experience. If ever you get the chance to walk or run the Nullarbor instead of driving, do it. And if you don't feel like doing that, drive out there and at least stop. So many people hit the number. I've had people say to me, said, how the hell do you do it? I've driven it. How the hell do you? I said, how the hell do you drive it? How can you not stop? Do you know there's a teddy bear tree out on the Nullarbor? There's, a, there's, a, there's a, 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 a teacup tree and there's people make little stone people and dress them and they write messages on the, on the ground because they're moving east and they're declaring this new beginning. It's an amazing place. It's the first place I've ever seen a rainbow from one side to the other, a full rainbow from one horizon to the other. It's like being under a multicolored cathedral. You know, it's the first time I've seen so many sunrises. It's the first time I've seen so many sunsets. It's the first time I've stood there and openly wept just because of this vast open space that I just felt connected to. Four weeks. It was my 40 days, my 40 nights. It was an amazing place to be. But it wasn't just a personal journey, or rather it was a personal journey, but I mean there were other aspects. I mean, some of the disciplines I learned, I mean, this, miles and miles and miles, you know, kilometre after kilometre of this, like the 90 miles straight, 146 kilometres, it'll take you about an hour to drive, and it's three days of my life. You know, you just keep going, you keep making that relentless forward progress. And we went to some amazing places, but we didn't just see amazing places, we met some amazing people. We had people bring shopping out onto the Nullarbor on their way back to Melbourne. People that I never knew. They wouldn't take money. Had people stop and say, well, what are you doing? I didn't see a car. There's no car broken down. Well, what are you doing? Are you okay? And I go, well, when I tell you what I'm doing, I'll let you decide if I'm okay or not. <laughs> so I'm actually walking and running Perth. Oh, wow, that's amazing. Is it for a cause? Yeah, Heart Foundation. Oh, here's 50 bucks. I'm telling you, if ever I find myself in trouble, I am not going into Perth. I'm not getting a cardboard sign. I'm not sitting there saying hungry and homeless. 
I'm getting some high vis and I'm going to walk along the highway and tell people I'm raising money for charity. But the generosity of people was amazing and that really started to touch me. It wasn't something I expected. I thought I was going to do this amazing thing, but the way that people responded started to really, really just become this central thing, the central part of my experience. And we had some amazing memories. I mean, this is like a Forrest Gump moment. You know, I, I selfies all the way. In fact, I think there was one article that appeared in the Daily Mail, I think it was the Daily Mail Australia, then UK, that said, um, the Australian Forrest Gump, who's going 5,400 kilometres, taking selfies along the way. Because <laughs> every time there was a sign, it was like, Post on to Facebook. Fidipides couldn't do that. And then um, September the 17th, 2015, that guy there is not the guy that set off four months before. That guy there is probably not even the guy that stood here now. But that guy has stood there composing himself because he knows he's about to collapse in a complete emotional heap. This is the day we walked into Brisbane. I'm probably about 100 metres from our virtual finish line. But more importantly, it's the day after the night before where we had a live beam into the out of the box meeting, which just happened to be the night before. And we did a Google Hangout, and I was like, in the, I was in the, I was fully clothed. It was okay, um, on the, and up from my bed in the back of the camper van. So that was really fantastic to share that with you guys. But then the next morning, I, I didn't use the other. There's a photo that kind of went all over the internet for a while. That was just me sat on some steps crying. I did a lot of crying. Um, on the Saturday after this, we actually officially finished the journey with a 5k park run. And at the finish line, the finishing token was handed to me by my son. My, my, he was then six, who had been secretly flown to meet me. I hadn't seen him for four months. And, yeah, guess what? I was a mess again. <laughs> but um, from this experience, you know, this, this isn't the end. This is another finish line. So what's, another, what's the finish line? It's another start line. Because all that experience out on the road... All that connection I was making, I just knew that I was in the middle of something that was far, far bigger than me. I mean, this is the guy, let's just quickly recap. There's a guy that wanted to lose a bit of weight, get fit and healthy, and be less likely to fall over dead within the next couple of years. That's all I wanted to do. And it went from that to finishing a marathon. And it went from a marathon... Like, ironically, I didn't finish the cross-country course at school, and I ended up doing the biggest cross-country run that you can imagine. I mean, why I couldn't come up with this idea when I was still in the UK? I mean, the UK is like that big. And Australia, like, it's bloody huge. It's like nine weeks to Adelaide, for crying out loud. <laughs> but I knew that, um, that something else was going to come from this. And this is where we are today. That Hearts Across Australia is no longer just a project name. It's not just the name that I came up with because of the hearts going across the Google map. Now, Hearts Across Australia are in the process of setting up a not-for-profit organisation just to incorporate as a member-based organisation. We are going to offer, we're in partnership with the Heart Foundation and through the Heart Foundation offering an international and a domestic marathon programme uh, with a focus on raising money. $3, every $3,000 that we raise, the Heart Foundation have agreed they will purchase and install an automated external defib, which will be deployed into a community location, have a direct impact on community and save lives. Now, it's not going into their research. It's not going to be... So many times I get asked the question, where does my money go? It's going to a defib. If it goes through us for the Heart Foundation, it's a defib. We um, basically advocate for that healthy and active lifestyle, embracing running, embracing walking. Go down to your local park run on a Saturday morning. Get out. If it means getting out and doing Pokemon Go... Then do it, you know, as long as, you're getting, as long as you're getting healthy and active and just really doing something good for your own life. We have an annual challenge. It's a 101-day challenge. The reason it's 101 day, it just happened to coincide with the time it took me to get from Perth to Sydney. So they crossed the country. We've got a challenge out there for people. They sign up, they get a nice medal, and they do as many kilometres as they can. We, um, I love this last one. <laughs> It's just a little line, future large-scale big adventures, and not me. 
I love the fact it's not me. Because what started happening now, I mean, I'm sure you're all familiar with law of attraction. And when you're operating at a certain level, you start getting similar things and people and, and opportunities appearing in your life. So I've had, I've finished the HBF fun run, uh, HBF run for a reason, and a guy in a wheelchair approaches me. He's just finished the half marathon distance, stock standard wheelchair. And he said, I've been looking for you. He said, I've been following you online. He said, um, I've kind of got a bit stuck with some of my dreams. He said, I love what you said, you inspire me. I love what you're doing. And I kind of want you to mentor me. I said, oh, that, that's cool. I said, like, I've just done 12Ks. I'm a bit emotional. Like, you know, don't make me, but I'm known to burst into tears, so don't do it. <laughs> and his dream is to push that wheelchair from Perth to Melbourne along the Nullarbor in a wheelchair. Has that sunk in? Because the guy is nuts. And Sunday just gone, he took part, he was the first wheelchair athlete to take part in WA Marathon Club Wally Cairns cross country event. It's basically five kilometres of sand up in Kings Park. It's a hill, sand, grass, mud. He did one lap in the time it took runners to do three. There are pictures of him, you can see the effort in his face and his biceps are bulging. This guy is determined. You know, the thing that really, really struggles, he struggles with is the internet and computers. So that's where we fit in. We're going to give him a social media platform. I've got a guy in Melbourne who was born with two fingers on one hand and he wants to run from Melbourne to Perth. He reckons he's going to do 100 k's a day. I don't think he's going to do that, but I've put him in touch with a guy that was running around Australia at the same time that I was running across and we're going to work together. He wants to run under the Hearts Across Australia banner as well. So I'm actually blown away by the way that this thing has grown into this massive mission and this ma massive vision. And if you, part of that thing, we're talking about the domestic and international marathon program, you don't have to run across the country, but I would encourage as many people, this is what we're doing at the moment, we're act actively looking for people, and I know there's a few of you are looking really keen to be involved in this. There's, uh, there's people, who's actually run a marathon? Yep. Who's run a half marathon? Yep. Who wants to run more? Yeah, good. So what we're doing next year through the Heart Foundation, um, with, I need to work out the details of the packages that they're offering. It's a travelling fit thing, but they're guaranteed places, which is, you know, they're rare as hen's teeth, because you, otherwise you go into the ballot or you qualify. So next year we're aiming to do London. I actually have a place from this year. I didn't go, get to go across this year because I had a contract. But um, we're going to go basically get a group to go to London again. We get a group to go to New York. I'm probably not going to make that one, but we'll get a group going across under the banner. And then slap bang in the middle, we got the Gold Coast Marathon. Now the Gold Coast Marathon's got a marathon, a half marathon, a 10K, and I think a 5K as well. And we're going to try and get as big a group as possible wearing hearts across Australia singlets to get over to the Gold Coast and, and just raise some awareness. I think that one's more about awareness raising and going over to the Gold Coast and having a bloody good time because it's an awesome event. If you go to the next one, this is the team that we sent across this year. This is, let's just remind you, I wanted to lose weight and give up fags. And now there's a team running under the name that I kind of invented on the spur of a moment. Over in London this year, um, Unfortunately, Mel couldn't be here tonight because it would have been awesome if you'd had a chance to talk to her and she could tell you how amazing that London was. Mel ran her first marathon. Julia ran, she's from Adelaide, she ran, I think, maybe her second marathon. Uh, Kat, in the middle, ran with a broken foot, basically. She had, all, she had a hip operation, she was determined to go to London. She had all kinds of injuries going on, but she went out and she, she said, oh, I'm just going to go and enjoy it. And she smashed out something like four hours, 12 minutes, and has since suffered because you, know, you don't do that kind of thing and get away with it. But she absolutely smashed London and smashed herself at the same time. Kerrin is a WA Marathon Club person, great friend of mine. Done heaps of marathons but had a whale of a time. She, she's the one that ran around the whole London course taking selfies. And, and John's just an amazing runner. But these guys, if you could get in a room and talk to them, they had a, an amazing experience doing something absolutely fantastic. So... 
If you're interested, we're going to have, um, I think there's a link we're going to make available on the Hearts Across Australia webpage. There's some technical issues. It hasn't actually gone live today, but um, tomorrow, or by the time we get to tomorrow morning, you know, if you're interested in running any of these marathons, then please, 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 you know, let me know, and then we can start talking. And if you're just interested in doing something in the future, then let me know as well, because you know, we'll just keep in touch, because we're going to do some absolutely bloody amazing stuff with this. Now, if I'm going to finish by going back to my friend, Philippides, Philippides, Zebedee, I don't know. Um, what happened to him? We're going to just close by saying, unfortunately for Philippides, he ran 40 k's from Athens, uh, back to Athens from Marathon, proclaimed that there had been victory over the Persians. He then collapsed and died. I don't suggest you do that as part of your marathon program. Not a good idea. But I think it's very symbolic of what actually happened in that story because when I ran my first marathon, old me died. New me emerged. And not only did new me emerge, hearts across Australia emerged. And the mission and the vision and the impact that we're going to have on other people's lives. So if you go away from this little talk of mine tonight, just remember one thing. If you change your thinking, and if you run a marathon in particular, you will change not only your life, you will change many, many lives, and you will make life amazing. Thank you. Can I just say thank you for Gary? I don't know. I, I was just like, wow. Um, can, can I just go back on one little point, though? Because I feel like Gary was just launching into um, tech speak on the defibs. So I, I know he is very passionate about making donations real and live. And by the way, you're dancing Zorba after this, just a warm up. Um, but can you actually say what they are and what they do? Is that all right if we just go over that? Okay, so the automated external defib, you'll actually see them if you go, if you're in Perth and you go to the bus port and you know, in quite a lot of public locations now, you will see a heart symbol, you'll see a box and there'll be a unit. In a lot of gyms, you will see them as well. Um, essentially what they do, they're fully automated and you literally, in the case of somebody having a cardiac arrest, you basically access these devices, you kind of put it out. You know when you watch um, like the movies, the American movies, and it's like, ah, stand back, clear! <laughs> That's kind of what these things do, but with less entertainment value. And they, they, uh, some of the models will actually have like a voice that will talk you through it, the, through, through the procedure. So if you've got somebody who's actually suffering a cardiac arrest, you can get deploy one of these things there and it can potentially save their life. I mean, they actually say that you know, by getting that assistance to somebody within, I, I can't remember the time, but you know, as quickly as possible at the end of the day, then um, you're going to save their life or you're going to stand a greater chance of saving their life. Um, it's actually... Um, there's a, a program called the Community First Responder... And if you basically get in touch with emergency services, they have a database that will basically know that they're, you know, so if you tell them there's somebody having a heart attack, they can actually call somebody up or inform you that there is an automated defib in the location. So you can get access to that. And I think the way that it works is that there's like a code and you can get into it and you can get this thing and deploy it onto the person. Now, I do happen to... I, 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 um, this isn't a defib story, but it's a case of the difference that you can make by being there and getting somebody um, some attention quickly rather than having to wait for the ambos and the paramedics. Uh, at Joondalup, Lake Joondalup Park Run, I think a couple of months ago, one of the runners um, about a K away from the finish line actually collapsed and had a heart attack and he was unconscious, doesn't remember a thing about it. And he, he got lucky because uh, a couple of the other runners are nurses. They're medical, uh, there's a doctor and a nurse and... 
So he actually had instant medical assistance. You know, he had somebody there applying the whole CPR thing, and uh, it went on for ages, uh, and the paramedics had issues getting into a locked gate. And all but the fact that he had that attention sooner rather than later meant that a few weeks later he went back to Park Run and told everybody he was okay, and he thanked them for, for saving his life. And that's what these AEDs, the automated defibs can do. The more that we get deployed, I've actually got a friend, this is where the idea originally came from. I've got a friend who lost her husband through heart disease, and she had a vision that they would be as commonly installed as a fire extinguisher. And I think it would be a wonderful thing if we, if we can do that, because the more of these things are around, you just don't know who that heart disease is going to affect. You can be perfectly fit. There was a, an army captain dropped dead um, within uh, about three kilometres of the London Marathon finish line this year. You know, perfectly fit, serving an army captain because they had genetic issues. So therefore, don't do a marathon. Sorry. Sorry. What's that? What was that? So therefore, don't do a marathon. Yeah, don't, don't, no, marathons, marathons are good. <laughs> um, but yeah, so... <laughs> no, don't do a marathon. Don't do a marathon. Do an ultra and do a trail ultra. <laughs> All right, now he's seriously lost it. So if you want to know more about dying by heart attack or running marathons, Gary is your man. But seriously, he wants to make this whole giving to charity thing very practical and very visible in the community. So that's what those AECD thingos are, which is what a hearts across Australia is. We are now going to very shortly have a Zorba dance competition and there are prizes. So there we go. Thank you, Gary. Can we have a round of applause for Gary?